Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 39. In this lecture, we'll discuss temperature. This topic is covered in Chapter 19 of our textbook by Sorway and Jouette. It is an observational fact that two objects, for example, a block of aluminum and a block of copper, when placed in physical contact, may exchange energy with each other. There are several different mechanisms for this exchange of energy, but for now we're primarily interested in molecular collisions. So as the molecules of one object, let's say the block of copper, collide with the molecules of the other object, the block of aluminum, they may exchange kinetic energy between them. You've studied collisions between particles back in your mechanics course. There you studied the collision of only two particles, and you saw how the momentum and the kinetic energy of particles could change as a result of collisions. Here we're imagining essentially the same scenario, but not just with two particles, instead with trillions and trillions of particles colliding every second. The net result of all these collisions could be a net exchange of kinetic energy. So on a very microscopic level, energy might flow from object A to object B or vice versa, but on a large scale, on the average, we might notice a flow of energy from one object to the other through these molecular collisions. Now this doesn't have to happen all the time. Sometimes the net energy of an object remains exactly the same before and after physical contact. Two objects are said to be in thermal equilibrium if no energy is exchanged between them when brought into physical contact. This concept of thermal equilibrium will be important to us. Note that thermal equilibrium is different from mechanical equilibrium. Back in your mechanics course, you learned that an object or a system is in mechanical equilibrium when the sum of all forces or the net force acting on it is equal to zero. Here, we're using the word equilibrium in a very different sense. Thermal equilibrium specifically refers to the exchange of energy between two objects. The concept of thermal equilibrium finds its utility in the zeroth law of thermodynamics. This law used to be known as the law of thermal equilibrium, but after the first law of thermodynamics and the second law and the third law were formulated, people gradually realized that this law is also quite important and serves a foundational purpose. So people started calling it the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Regardless of what you call it, the law states that if objects A and C are separately in thermal equilibrium with a third object B, then A and C are in thermal equilibrium with each other. So think about that for a few seconds. It's somewhat abstract. Maybe I can explain it a little bit better using a picture. What we're saying is this. Suppose we have three objects, A, B, and C. These three objects could be any three objects. You could have, for example, a block of steel, a block of copper, and a block of aluminum, but they could also be just a block of ice and the air surrounding that block of ice, and let's say the table on which the ice rests. So the three objects could really be any three objects, and they could be solid, liquid, or gas. The point is that if objects A and B are in thermal equilibrium, so if these two are brought in physical contact and we notice that they do not exchange energy, and furthermore B and C are separately in thermal equilibrium, so when these two objects are brought in physical contact, they also do not exchange energy, then we are guaranteed that when A and C are brought in physical contact, they too will not exchange energy, they will be in thermal equilibrium. The zeroth law of thermodynamics might remind you a little bit of the transitive property from mathematics. In mathematics, we learn that if A equals B and B equals C, then A must equal to C. This is known as the transitive property, and it describes essentially a property of the equality sign. It holds true for any set of mathematical objects, A, B, and C.
So A, B, and C could be ordinary numbers, they could be complex numbers, they could be vectors, they could be matrices, they could be tensors, they could be any mathematical objects, and the transitive property would hold for them. The transitive property is similar to the zeroth law of thermodynamics, but they're definitely not the same thing. The zeroth law of thermodynamics is stating something very specific about the thermodynamic properties of physical systems. The importance of the zeroth law for us is that it suggests that we may choose one of the objects, let's say object B, as our reference object. So for example, if we want to know whether objects A and C are in thermal equilibrium, we don't necessarily have to put them in physical contact. We could just choose a third object and bring that third object separately in physical contact with A and C. And if those two scenarios result in thermal equilibrium, then we are guaranteed that A and C will be in thermal equilibrium as well. The importance of this notion lies in the fact that we can now devise a thermometer. So object B, the reference, could be an object which we call a thermometer that is used to determine when objects are in thermal equilibrium. For example, if we want to know how the temperature outside on a cold day compares to the temperature of frozen water, we don't necessarily have to put the air and frozen water in contact with each other. We can just devise a thermometer, a third object, let's say a volume of alcohol, and we can place that thermometer separately in contact with the frozen water and the cold air outside and compare their thermal equilibrium to each other. So the zeroth law of thermodynamics suggests that we may choose an object as a reference for thermal equilibrium. Once we have a reference or standard object, we can then assign numbers to different states of that reference object. These numbers are known as the temperatures of that object. A little more precisely, temperature is that property which determines if two objects are in thermal equilibrium or not. For example, consider any two objects which we'll label as object A and object B. By placing each object in contact with our reference object, with our thermometer, we can assign numbers to A and B, which we'll call the temperature of A and the temperature of B. If temperature of A is equal to temperature of B, we can then say that A and B are in thermal equilibrium, and if those numbers are not equal to each other, then objects A and B are not in thermal equilibrium. Note that we never have to put objects A and B in actual physical contact. We separately need to put them in contact only with our thermometer, with our reference object. Now, it turns out there are many, many choices for the reference object, and there are many, many ways in which one could assign numbers to different states of the thermometer, of the reference object. In other words, these choices are not at all unique, but the three most common choices are the scales invented by Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. In this class, we're primarily interested in the Kelvin temperature scale, but we also need to know about the Fahrenheit and Celsius temperature scales. Daniel Fahrenheit was a Polish-German physicist who introduced his temperature scale in 1724. Fahrenheit chose brine as his reference object. More specifically, he chose a particular solution of water and salt. He set the freezing point of brine to be equal to zero degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit chose brine because he was primarily interested in the thermodynamics of the human body, and the human body consists primarily of water and minerals. Salt is probably the most important of those minerals. He then chose the human body temperature to correspond to 96 degrees Fahrenheit, although that number was later adjusted. So today we know that the average human body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, although originally Fahrenheit used the numbers 0 and 96 for his reference objects of brine and the human body. A couple of decades after Fahrenheit, Anders Celsius, who was a Swedish physicist, introduced his temperature scale. 
Celsius recognized that the human body was not a very stable reference object. The temperature of the human body varies throughout the day and also depends on the level of activity, so Celsius chose pure water as his reference object. Initially, he used an inverted temperature scale, so he assigned the number 100 to the freezing point and 0 to the boiling point of water, and although that's mathematically permissible, he quickly realized that it's not a very intuitive system, so he switched it. He assigned the number 0 to the freezing point of water and 100 degrees Celsius to the boiling point of water, and of course that's how we know the Celsius temperature scale today. The Celsius scale is also known as the centigrade temperature scale, although today, to honor Celsius, we primarily refer to it as the Celsius scale. Almost a century after Celsius, William Thomson introduced his temperature scale. William Thomson had an aristocratic title. He was known as the first Baron Kelvin, so his temperature scale came to be known as the Kelvin temperature scale. Kelvin wasn't the first, but he was one of the first to recognize that there must be a minimum temperature that any object could have. He referred to that minimum temperature as infinite cold, although that term is a little bit misleading, so today we refer to it as absolute zero. Kelvin also realized that the boiling point of water can depend on the ambient pressure. So at sea level, where the ambient pressure is one atmosphere, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. However, on top of Mount Everest, for example, where the pressure is much lower, water boils at 70 degrees Celsius. So Kelvin decided not to use the boiling point of water as a reference point. Instead, he chose the triple point of water as his reference point. The triple point of water is that unique combination of pressure and temperature at which water can coexist in three different phases. So at the triple point of water, we can have liquid water and ice and steam coexisting in a stable configuration. He assigned the number 273.16 to the triple point of water. He probably could have chosen a more round number, like 100. However, he chose 273.16 because he wanted the increments on the Kelvin temperature scale to be equal to the increments on the Celsius temperature scale. What that means is that a change of 1 degree Celsius is equal to a change of 1 degree Kelvin. The SI unit of temperature is the Kelvin so that's the unit that we'll primarily use in this class. However, you need to be familiar with the other two temperature scales as well. In particular, you need to be able to convert between these temperature scales. Converting from Celsius to Fahrenheit uses this particular formula here. T sub F is the temperature in Fahrenheit and T sub C is the temperature in Celsius. Note that according to this formula, one increment in Fahrenheit scale is equal to nine-fifths of one increment in Celsius scale. What that means is that when we say the temperature has, let's say, increased by one degree Fahrenheit, what we're really saying is that the temperature has increased by nine-fifths of one degree Celsius. To convert from the Celsius to the Kelvin scale, you will need this formula, T sub K is the temperature expressed in Kelvin. Note that according to this formula, one increment in Kelvin scale is exactly equal to one increment in Celsius scale, although the two temperature scales have different zeros. Their zeros are offset by 273.15 degrees. Here's a fun fact for you. You can be cooled to minus 273.15 Celsius and still be... Okay. Over the next few lectures, we're going to do a lot of temperature conversions, so you need to become very comfortable with that. Note, however, that converting temperatures is a little bit different than converting other units of measurement, primarily because the three temperature scales that we want to use in this class all have different zeros. This is a little bit different than, for example, length scales or mass scales that always have the same zero. For example, 
zero inches equals zero centimeters equals zero miles equals zero kilometers. Similarly, zero grams equals zero kilograms equals zero pounds. So length and mass scales always have the same zero, but temperature scales don't always have the same zeros. This is a little bit like representing the three temperature scales by three rulers whose zeros are placed at different points on an object. So zero Fahrenheit does not correspond to zero Celsius, and that in turn does not correspond to zero Kelvin. In many of the equations that we'll encounter, we'll be interested in the change in temperature, delta T, and when we encounter those equations, you have to be really careful because delta T expressed in Fahrenheit is not necessarily equal to delta T in Celsius. It does turn out that the increments on the Celsius scale are equal to the increments on the Kelvin scale. So when on the Celsius temperature scale, the temperature changes, let's say by five degrees, we can be sure that the temperature on the Kelvin scale will also change by five degrees. This means that in equations where you'll see delta T, you don't necessarily have to convert from Celsius to Kelvin, but you will have to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit. We will also see many equations in which we're interested in the ratios of two temperatures. Now, ratios are very nice to deal with when you're dealing with length or mass. For example, two inches divided by four inches is equal to two centimeters divided by four centimeters. In both of those cases, the ratio is exactly equal to 0.5. However, that's not the case with temperature scales because they have different zeros. So T1 divided by T2, when expressed in the Fahrenheit scale, is not the same as T1 divided by T2 when expressed in the Celsius scale. So in general, when you see equations involving T or delta T or ratios of two temperatures, you need to exercise some extra care and pay special attention to the units that are being used. So let's end this lecture with a practice problem on conversions. Here I just want to set the contrast between temperature conversions and other types of conversions that you've done in the past. This first one should be a relatively easy one. Objects 1 and 2 have lengths of 5 centimeters and 15 centimeters. Calculate the ratio L2 to L1 in centimeters and in inches. So performing the calculation in centimeters is easy because those numbers are given to you. Length 2 in centimeters is 15 centimeters. Length 1 in centimeters is 5 centimeters. When you take the ratio of these two numbers, you can see that the centimeters in the numerator cancels the centimeters in the denominator. And then of course, 15 divided by five gives you three. At this point, you could look up the conversion factor for centimeters and inches, and you will find that length two in inches is approximately 5.906. Length one in inches is approximately 1.969. You can see again that the inches in the numerator cancels the inches in the denominator. And when you divide 5.906 by 1.969, once again, you get three. This is probably as expected. Essentially for all length scales, the ratio will always be the same, whether you use centimeters, inches, micrometers, miles, or kilometers. That's not the case with temperature conversions. Temperature conversions tend to be a little trickier. Here's an example. Objects 1 and 2 have temperatures of 20 C and 60 C. Calculate the ratio T2 divided by T1 in Celsius and in Kelvin. Calculating the ratio in Celsius is easy. T2 in degrees Celsius is 60. T1 in Celsius is 20. Of course, the Celsius in the numerator cancels the Celsius in the denominator, and 60 divided by 20 is simply 3. Now, you can look up the conversion from Celsius to Kelvin, and you will find that temperature 2 in Kelvin is 333.15, and temperature 1 in Kelvin is 293.15. The Kelvin in the numerator 
cancels the Kelvin in the denominator. But now when you divide 333 by 293, what you get is approximately 1.136. So we're definitely not getting the same ratio as we did before. This is important. This is telling you that when you want to calculate the ratio of two temperatures, you have to be very careful about the units that you want to use. Here's another example. Temperature of an object is changed from some initial temperature to some final temperature. We're going from 20 C to 60 C. Calculate the temperature change in all three temperature scales. So here we just want to calculate delta T. Remember that delta T is basically T final minus T initial, but we want to calculate delta T in Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. Calculating delta T, delta T in Celsius is easy because those numbers are given to you. 60 minus 20 gives us 40 degrees Celsius. You can look up the conversion from Celsius to Kelvin. You will see that 60 Celsius is 333.15 Kelvin. 20 Celsius is 293.15 Kelvin. And when you take the difference between those, you get 40 Kelvin. So notice that we're getting numerically the same number here and here. This tells us that increments or changes on the Kelvin scale are always equal numerically to the increments or changes on the Celsius scale. However, that's not the case with the Fahrenheit scale. If you do the conversion, you'll see that 60 degrees Celsius is 140 Fahrenheit and 20 degrees Celsius is 69 Fahrenheit. And when you take the difference between those, you get a genuinely distinct numerical value. Delta T in the Fahrenheit scale is 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So once again, before you calculate any ratios or any changes or any deltas in temperatures, you should think carefully about what temperature scale you want to use. In most cases, it is best if you use the Kelvin temperature scale. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.